Hey, we're a little early. We'll get started. Uh, this is legal aspects of uh, active defense. I am always uh, pleased when techies come and want to see how law intersects with technology. And years ago, I, I had mentioned that to Marcus Sachs, who's a SANS instructor in Verizon and all that stuff. And I said, Marcus, I'm, I'm always amazed that like, the room will fill up and people will actually show up. And he said, yeah, or the other rooms are all full and they don't have any else place to go. So if you're here because you're interested in how they intersect, great, you're, you're wonderful, uh, this is great. And if you're here because all the other rooms have filled up and you couldn't go anyplace else, Sorry about that. We'll try to get bigger rooms next time. Um, so legal aspects of computer network defense, uh, the agenda, the things we're going to talk about here as we go through uh, to figure out what are those things that you need to do to be able to do uh, computer network active defense. Uh, disclaimer aspect on things, I am here in a personal capacity. I represent no employer, entity, government organization, anything. Uh, so I hope to be uh, informative to you and give you some information and yet still maybe a little bit entertaining. I uh, have spoken at, at numerous Black Hats and DEF CONs before and typically I have the only million dollar giveaway. And, and what that is is for any question or the best question, best comment or even best heckle, I usually will give away a $5, a $10 or a $25 chip under the million dollar giveaway. Now you have to take the chip and go out to the casino and parlay that into a million dollars um, on that. Um, now I normally, that's what I do. I'm going to apologize. That's been canceled due to sequestration. <laughs> Um, so if you want to put, if, if you're pissed at your government for things, let me explain something. Talk to my wife about having 20% pay taken away. That's when you get pissed when you have to deal with that on the home front. Um, there is a, uh, a current topic out there um, that is uh, uh, quite uh, pressing. Um, it, it is ripe for comedy um, and, I, and they've been having fun with it. Um, it involves the United States government. Um, and while uh, the United States government was founded on happiness, um, I think if you look at the Declaration of Independence in there, you will see that basically, uh, you know, it is founded on happiness. We are the only happy country. You look at any of the other documents out there, the Magna Carta or anything, they don't mention happiness. With that said, I have spoken to uh, sources familiar with the matter and they tell me that the government has no sense of humor on this topic. And so therefore we will not be making any jokes about that whatsoever. Um, as we go along, I, I have an active defense scenario uh, to talk about. Um, a, a spoiler alert here, uh, if you don't want to know how it comes out at the end, uh, please turn away from the screens um, and look the other way uh, because the way it ends, uh, he, he's the bad guy um, uh, on this. And if you're from my generation, actually he's the bad guy. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and I know we're not supposed to do any sponsorships or plugs but because my, I'm a Chrysler kid from Detroit, Michigan and uh, I can also get fine Corinthian leather uh, from, uh, from him uh, on that. This is the first year um, that I'm going to hand out a, a Robert Clark um, Cybersecurity Award. Um, and it, it, I want, what, what? Drink. Oh, okay, wait. Drink. Uh, there was a different one last year at Black Hat. They said anytime somebody says cyber, you're supposed to shout out something else. Um, I can't stand the word cyber. Absolutely hate it. Um, I'm a computer network you know, guy from the aspects of a decade. But if you want to have money thrown at anything, you've got to have the word cyber in it. Um, if you wanted porta potties for DOD, you would say these are cyber porta potties and they would give you thousands of dollars for these things. Um, and, and of course you would say, okay, well wait a second, what makes it a cyber porta potty? Well, there's a keypad and uh, don't even go there. Um, so um, I would like to give the first Robert Clark Cybersecurity Award to someone um, who has done something to advance cybersecurity. So who, who should this possibly go to? Because you've got folks like, you know, Leo Laporte out there doing stuff, uh, Tom Merritt's doing good work. Yeah, I like Steve Gibson's aspect and um, I even like uh, Patrick Gray and, and, and the Risky Business. All these folks are out there. And while I would like to kiss up to them to get onto their shows, um, I really actually want to kiss up to Stephen Colbert. Um, now, if you're wondering why, um, well, you know, he knows the technology. Now, granted, um, a couple years ago it was very archaic. Of course, this might be the securest way to communicate these days. Um, I can't see below the table to see if there's anybody in the middle, but y y you never know. 
but he knows the technology. I mean, he gets customized technology that he gets to use. One of the first users of a tablet into that, you know, virtualization aspects, even invented his own Google Glasses. Um, so from that aspect, you know, what more could you want from somebody? He knows the technology so much, he even advised Anthony Weider, a.k.a. Carlos Danger, they should be using Snapchat. So, uh, you know, the guy's there. He knows the web. He knows iTunes. He's got Google down. Bing. Twitter. Bitcoin he even talks about. And even PalTalk. And if someone could come and tell me what PalTalk is afterwards, I'd appreciate that. He knows the people. He's, you know, from, from uh, Jobs to Schmidt and Gates and even knows Anonymous. As a matter of fact, he probably knows Anonymous a little too well and too closely. <laughs> if that's not enough for this award, he's got a virtual presence. He's on the International Space Station and he's even in animation. So, you know, in my book, he deserves the first Robert Clark Cybersecurity Award and if this isn't enough to get me on his show, I, I really don't know what it's going to take because uh, it's not going to be my intellect from that aspect of it. So. Now, getting on to things. Disclaimer, again, I am here in a personal capacity. Um, all the opinions are my own. Cyber education is a big piece. Um, I am actually leaving the United States Army Cyber Command, which is not the same agency as the United States Cyber Command. I work for General Hernandez. Um, and this is my last day actually working for him. And tomorrow I start at uh, the Naval Academy out in Annapolis on their faculty to uh, educate, so I'm now, I'm a professor of law, this is sweet, um, to teach uh, midshipmen on the non-technical content for cyber operations, the law and policy aspects on life. Um, and so they have two core classes that every midshipman must take and we're developing a cyber operations major. West Point also has an Army Cyber Center, uh, so I will mention that with my uh, Army heritage. Um, and then uh, the other service um, has something they're doing too. Uh, but I, I have no affiliation with them, so. Um, if I say something wrong, please by all means say you heard it from an officer at Army Cyber Command. And if I say something right, please say that this brilliant professor from the Naval Academy said. I'd appreciate that. When I go to an, uh, a conference, I'm, I'm really hoping that I'm only taking away one or two golden nuggets of information because if I'm not, then I'm really stupid and I really should be studying a lot more. And so the one uh, golden nugget I want to give right up front if you're interested in this area, uh, the American Bar Association, their cybersecurity task force, is going to be coming out with a report, they're supposed to be coming out soon, on active defense. So I would say, Tuck this away if this is an area you're really interested in and uh, go to their site down the road here and see if they, they have that coming out because uh, they're going to talk about some beaconing and some other aspects of it. So it might be something to tuck away in a back pocket as we're moving about talking about doing active defense. So uh, law and computer network operations. Uh, if you ask the same question to two attorneys, you will get a lot of, you'll get four answers and there's only two attorneys there. Um, so the thing is, you know, I'm not your lawyer and please ask questions at any time, stand up, shout, we'll be glad to address them. The interaction is, is really what makes this thing go. But I would like to talk, if anyone was in Mark Weatherford's talk um, on the growing irrelevancy of uh, U.S. government uh, information sharing, he made a point about attorneys, he didn't say which ones, uh, and he said that they were very risk averse and didn't understand the technology. Uh, we'll get into Clark's law about dealing with your lawyers and technology a little bit here. The aspect about being risk adverse and what a lawyer's role is, and, and this is kind of for you. I provide advice. I, I give counsel. If it's something illegal, I'll say th this breaks the law if it violates a policy, but I provide advice. The responsibility to act on that belongs to my client or the commander or the government and it's their job to say, got it, okay, but you don't let your general counsel run your company from that aspect. And that's kind of an interesting take that I had a problem with, with, with Mark Weatherford's comments. And it's not, I understand the scenario. Yes, senior leadership's not going to do anything unless their general counsel says, yes, you can do that. That's backwards. The senior leadership is supposed to listen to their general counsel. It's their attorney, but they make the decisions. And if they're not going to make the decisions, then they're the ones who are risk adverse. Um, and so that's the aspect, and that's kind of the role. Because when the day's over, I'm going to go home and have a steak dinner 
you guys might be led away with handcuffs on, but I, I'm going to go home and have a, a steak dinner uh, on that one. Before we get started, there are a couple cases I always like to point out. Um, United States versus Prochner was uh, the, rec uh, the courts recognizing that uh, computer security professionals are a special skilled group. Um, Proctor uh, had the right to remain silent, but he didn't have the ability and uh, gave a nice detailed confession to which the judge elevated his sentence and said, you've got special skills and the court's going to recognize that, so that's probably not a great thing uh, on uh, the computer security side. There's an interesting Wi-Fi case that came out. Now, it's a civil case and it's uh, one of them patent trolling cases. Um, in way, in way innovatio um, from this aspect, they're suing coffee houses and people that are using Wi-Fi um, and it's that wonderful legitimate suit where, you know, basically you send the coffee house uh, a notice saying for $7,000 I'll go away or we're going to sue you. Um, and they did it to 7,100 hotels, coffee shops uh, on that. And they had a motion to enter um, how they were going about sniffing and grabbing the communications uh, going across the, uh, um, the Wi-Fi. And, and how it worked was they were using, uh, uh, you know, grabbing data packets going over the unencrypted Wi-Fi, um, using things that are readily accessible to the general public, um, and that uh, the sniffing protocol they were using, again, was available to the general public. And the court was basically saying it falls under the wiretap exception and so there is no uh, problem with them doing this. You can have, with the proper foundation, this evidence can come in. So what they were doing is they were using a uh, riverbed air PCAP packet capture adapter for 700 bucks, um, Wireshark. So with the laptop software and the packet capture adapter, um, they could get any you know, communications as long as they were in range. You know, all these things are provided by commercial, uh, commercial providers. And so it didn't violate the wiretap statute. Now, this is kind of interesting, meaning, you know, so back in the day, and the, the way, you know, technology being generally available to people, it came back out of a case called Kilo where DEA was looking into a house using thermal imaging. And the court said, no, 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 that's not technology that's readily available to the public. They don't have their own helicopters with their own thermal imaging radar. So we're not going to let you do that. God, you know, what you folks are doing now in the technology that's available to the general public, um, it is a very interesting area where we're going into in terms of what you can sit there and sniff and grab that courts are holding, not a violation of uh, Electronic Communication Privacy Act. And, and of course you said the public's lack of awareness of this was irrelevant. So it's an interesting civil case that's out there. It's not a criminal case out there, but it was kind of interesting. The Constitution. Eh, pretty damn good document uh, to run a country of 350 million people or so. You know, written in 1787 and then what happened next for computers? Well, DOJ stood up the Computer Crime Unit in 1991. There's a little gap there um, on that. Um, and a little bit before that they did the Computer Fraud Act on that. So how does this law stuff apply to uh, we the geeks um, from that aspect? Now on the Constitution there is um, the Article 2 powers are the President's powers, so it's kind of an interesting aspect. There is a little known footnote in here that you got to kind of go, kind of look for that Madison put in there. You know, that he envisioned people like Jobs inventing communication devices that were incredible. So according under the Article 2 powers, the President can conduct computer network operations. He didn't, he goes, I don't know what a computer is, but I'm sure it's going to be important in a couple of years. And please keep an eye on the IRS for us. So. Legal aspects of computer network defense. Um, it's, we had a, a pre-conversation up front here. We were talking about some certain things. And um, an important lesson learned which is very relevant to the area we're in right now. And, and this is very true. Bad legal advice put OJ in jail. Um, it was an interesting aspect where, again, he wanted to get his property back. And his lawyer told him, hey, if you don't breach the peace, you know, don't use force, you can go get your property. And of course the facts of the cases were that he went there with a couple of buddies that had guns breaching the peace and he's in jail. And so basically he kind of needs that number right there. Um, if you uh, are out there, I've, I've seen some of the attendees doing things. This is a valid number. You may want to jot this down uh, for the weekend uh, on that. So again, I am not your lawyer. Um, when I try to come up with a topic for DEF CON, I want to make sure that it is relevant to what's going on. And this IP commission report just came out uh, recently and it was uh, interesting from the aspect of again DOJ had a chance to put in there that they say hey hacking back is illegal uh, so don't do it. The report was written by Dennis Blair who uh, used to work, uh, was the first DNI director and Huntsman who used to be the ambassador to China and the report really said that hey if I can retrieve my digital property without damaging that person's computers I should be able to do that. So we're talking about self-defense. 
There are uh, 21 state constitutions that say you have a constitutional right to defend your property on that. It is recognized in common law and goes back a long time that you have the right to defend yourself and your property from that aspect. And it kind of flows into this thing called trespass to chattel. Now, the Intel versus Hamadi case was that blasting of emails into Intel by Hamadi. And one of the things that the, the court said was we favor in this area trespass prevention over it over post trespass recovery. That's kind of the theme of what we're going to be talking about here. We're going to be talking about those things you do ahead of time so you don't have to do post trespass recovery. The active defense scenario obviously is going to be a post trespass recovery scenario um, and as we go down there. Self defense. You got to be in a place you have the right to be. A whole bunch of other factors that go with it but you really got to be in that place that you have a right to be. It is not unlimited for property. You can't, you know, usually use deadly force to defend your property uh, under certain circumstances. That actually will come back into play. So you got to be in a place you have the right to be with all the factors that go in there. We were also talking earlier about if we were going to do this, you know, who are the experts we listen to? Stuart Baker, usually uh, formerly of Steptoe and Johnson, uh, actually he's with them now, um, is quite the advocate that you should be able to hack back. And uh, I was at the AFCEA conference in uh, Maryland and he offered that to represent anybody who did it and was prosecuted by DOJ for free. Um, now you can you know, call him up and say, hey, I heard from this guy and he might hang up on you, but that's what I heard. Um, Oren Carr, who is a professor at George Washington University and writes the book on computer crime, has point blank said, uh, I don't think there's a digital self-help as the way things stand right now. So I'm sorry to ruin that for you for where we're going to go with our scenario here with that spoiler alert. But if it's me and I'm going to be prosecuted, I'm going to get Jennifer Granick or Oren Carr to represent me. And both of them have said there's no digital self-help, you know, self-defense here. Um, Gr Jennifer was on Patrick Gray's uh, Risky Business podcast 272 talking or 274 talking about this extensively and again she said you know there's no digital self-defense. So um, what you've got to do is we're talking about building that case of reasonableness. What are those things that you're going to do that are necessary and reasonable? So when we're building that case of reasonableness you've got to think of what are those things you're doing to secure and defend and you know it's that aspect of te technology, your open source and situational awareness and intelligence, your policies, your training, information control, active defense things you may need to do which might be deception, recovery operations, you know, the stopping the pain aspects on life and what is the one thing that was missing from all those slides that's extremely important to DOJ? Previous and ongoing coordination with law enforcement agencies. Um, and why is this important? Because if you're planning on doing this, in reality, why are you preparing for this? Because you're trying to convince DOJ not to prosecute you or any other type of law enforcement agency or prosecutorial office to prosecute you. What are the things I did ahead of time that were reasonable that I had to take the next step? You know, or worst case scenario, you're going to actually have to try to convince a judge or a jury that you have a self-defense claim. So the reality and the practicality of this is simply DOJ is always and has always been taking a hard look at this and a hard stance on this. Until the law is amended, they feel that this is a crime. Now, don't blame DOJ. Okay? You don't beat the monkey in the, if the organ grinder is not present. Okay? So go see Congress because Congress is the one that's responsible to amend the law for that aspect of it. So the requirements for a self-defense or a necessity defense um, require that there are no other lawful means available, meaning you've gone to and seen LEA. Um, all your, your remedies have been exhausted, meaning no law enforcement, you know, your civil lawsuits have been, been filed on that. And I go back to this prosecuting computer crimes hand manual that DOJ has had out for a long time. Again, you know, doing so may be illegal regardless of your motive. Um, the other aspect for, for you all that I've had uh, conversations with some techies on, it's the aspect of resource intensity. Um, I, I say, okay, so if you've got this honeypot with a bunch of fake documents in there and, that, and they say, you know, the big problem with this is my clients can't manage their real stuff and now you want them to have a bunch of fake stuff on there? They have enough time managing the real stuff. So this is very resource intensive um, from my perspective. So I don't think it's a mom and pop shop thing that they're going to be doing. Uh, I did government contract litigation and we had a lot of mom and pop uh, third party suppliers. I can't see they're the ones doing this. It's going to be somebody that's got a lot of resources uh, to dive into this. So building that case of reasonableness, the things I think you need to do so you can actually get to that active defense scenario. 
there's the technology you got to have in place. And you guys, I'm, I'm talking to the experts that know all of that. So you're talking about your different, you know, your firewalls, your intrusion systems, real-time network awareness, SSL proxy things, your logging, your monitoring, you know, on that. And, and you've got some honeypots flowing from that aspect. So you're doing all this. And of course, legally you can do this because to do this, you got to comply with the law, which would be the wiretap statute. So you're either getting consent of your users through your logins and your banners from that aspect on life, you know, or you're doing it in the service provider's aspect in terms of that exception to uh, the wiretap statute that says, hey, it, it's my property, I can defend it. It's necessary to the defense of the property. And, and these are the cases that came out of the blue box cases where they had to find out, you know, taking the Captain Crunch, uh, the whistle out of the Captain Crunch box. And it's back in the day where they recorded the beginning of the conversations, half of it and all of it. And when the cases got to the court, the judge said, okay, you recorded the front part of it. That was tailored. And you identified what the phone number was. Those are going to go forward. And where they recorded more of the conversation, like half of it, where the prosecutor could prove or, or, or submit why they needed to record half of it, those cases went forward. And if they couldn't, they were thrown out. And pretty much where they recorded the whole thing, the judge said, you didn't tailor this at all. We're throwing these out. So now, how do you tailor computer network defense? How do you tailor your intrusion detection systems? It's not like I can record the first part of the three-way handshake. And, and kind of in my opinion, it's like that means I'm going to run my snort sensors out there and I'm going to grab everything. Oh, you know, see how much my storage space is going to have, whether this sensor is overwritten in four hours or it stays on there for 30 days. And when I get my alerts, I can go back and grab the information and take a look at it to do my computer security. So from that aspect, that seems reasonable. It's tailored. And there really hasn't been an argument or a debate on that aspect of it for the, you know, from the technology speaking aspect. When I talk to techies, I always ask one thing. I'm like, why aren't the crown jewels um, air gapped off and why aren't they encrypted and data at rest? Because, I, 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 again, being the lawyer and the stupid one in the room, I'm thinking, okay, it's got to be expensive, it's got to take time, it's got to slow things down. And, you know, I've actually had techies come back and go, yeah, no, not so much. So if, if I'm wrong at that, please tell me um, on that aspect of it. But I'm always curious at why the crown jewels are, of a company aren't separated off, air-gapped, and there aren't things in place to protect them. Again, steps that are reasonable to defend the information and th that you want to do. I did mention beacons before. I, I will note that DOJ uh, has a, uh, again, it's one of those aspects of the absurdities of law, the way it's written. If you're not an electronic service provider, you can't do beacons. Um, it's a strange thing on that. Again, that's something that I'm hoping that the ABA uh, task force report will talk about as we go down the road. Pen testing and red teaming. Um, one of the things that uh, you need to kind of be concerned about is actually is the Landum Act. Um, it is a, a national system for trademark registration um, to protect your, your trademarks um, from either co uh, consumer confusion or dilution. Um, and that means if you're using that mark and it reduces people's perception of it, you, you could have a problem. Why would this come into this field? So you have, you go to your lawyer and you go, hey, we, we want to do some spear fishing. Okay. And uh, Beyonce's concert's coming up, so we want to send uh, that out to our employees that for $45, if you click here, you can get $45 tickets front row to Beyonce. Is that a problem? The lawyer doesn't know much about technology, is busy with other things, thinks, eh, yeah, go ahead. So they go ahead and they set that out. Next thing you know, uh, they forward it to two friends and they forward it to two friends and they forward it to two friends and it goes outside your network and now everyone's sitting there going, wow, we can get Beyonce tickets for $45 and someone's, Beyonce's attorney comes knocking at your door going, uh, who the hell are you and what the hell are you doing? You know, so that's the aspect. If you don't plan for these things and make them so they can't get released into the wild, you could have a problem here. Now, I am not a Lanham Act attorney and before you blast me to the you know, evaluation boards and everything, you need to understand one thing. You're going to go hire the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. And they're going to give you your legal advice for what you need to do. And there are a whole bunch of people in this law firm. And one of the branches you're going to have to go see is the Lanham Act branch to talk to them about this and how to go about doing that. So that's one situation in your law firm that you're going to have to deal with. Intelligence and situational awareness. You got to know what's going on out there. So you got your open source intelligence where you're going to have your bulletins from the US CERT. You're going to hire a commercial company to give you added intelligence on that because we know the government doesn't get anything first. Um, and so you're going to get that private information there. You're going to do active business intelligence, which you're going to do that competitive intelligence. And you got to be careful not to step on the side of the economic espionage. Economic espionage. So that's set up to protect trade secrets and information. Again, enacted, you know, in the time of this high technology information age. 
So, you know, a couple things. It's getting that information without authority. You know, you kind of know when you got it without authority and, and then the trade secrets. Now, good old Doug and Kristen here kind of wrote an article dealing with looking at these aspects of uh, economic espionage. And they say, hey, it's a very broad topic and, and you got to kind of be aware of it. You can get into trouble when you're doing this aspect of getting uh, open source intelligence. Some lawful means of going out and grabbing information can in fact become misappropriation. And so you've got to be careful because that combination of all that public information could get you into trouble. Again, this is kind of Doug and Kristen's you know, take on this. Now, there is a case out there that kind of said, look, open source and, and possession of open source information or readily ascertainable information is clearly not espionage. So you got some case law on your side there. But Bill Bradford kind of again went down this path and was talking about the different aspects of economic espionage when he was looking at firms routinely getting this stuff and that practice of getting open source publicly available information for that. So what are you talking about? The desired information you're looking at, you know, research plans, R&D, things of that nature, strategies that are out there, publicly available information. You know, you're looking at, you know, common ways to do this, you know, data mining, patent. I like the psychological modeling of rival executives. I think that's kind of neat. Uh, you know, it's like that. My wife wants me to have that done too. Um, you know, so there's that. Um, areas that kind of um, raise some questions um, that he looked at um, when you're talking about ethical questions was interesting because he's like appropriating documents that are misplaced by rivals um, which gets into, okay, if I got an iPhone left behind, um, you know, if you go to your lawyer and say, hey, I found this, and it's like, oh, abandoned property, hey, it's abandoned, there's no, exp you know, no rights to that property anymore, let's rip it apart. Yeah, okay, well, you, there might be that theory. Um, he talks about overhearing rivals, executives. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the fan, if you come talk to me on this one, it's going to be, hey, that's misplaced trust. I mean, that's, that's the third party doctrine where if you're going to say something broadcasting it out, you know, again, these are areas where it could raise ethical questions, you know, not, not quite blank, illegal. Hiring employees away from rivals, you got a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act thing that, that really comes into play on that one you got to be careful on. And I love the dumpster diving aspect on life because actually there's some court cases that once you put your trash out by the curb, you, anybody can go diving into it as much as they want. Those areas that are clearly, you know, illegal, yeah, kind of stuff that, you know, y'all are really good at um, on that. And so, uh, you know, you got to be careful on, on those things. Again, I am not uh, an espionage, economic espionage lawyer. So you're going to go to your law firm at Dewey, Cheatham and Howe. You're going to go up to the economic espionage branch and say, here's what I'm planning on doing on this. You know, what do you think? And you got to take them through step by step those things that you're going to do. Ironically enough, there was a case that came out uh, just a while ago, the uh, Alenovkov case. Um, and a lot of times when you read facts or opinions on a case, they, they kind of tell you where they're going as you go through them. So Sergey was a computer programmer for Goldman Sachs and he was responsible for one of their, you know, their high-end uh, important aspects. And uh, it did uh, market development. He was, um, it was proprietary information and he was one of uh, 25 programmers in the highest paid at $400,000 and this is where the facts get found and he's going to be hired at a competitor for a, a million bucks. So we can kind of see where things are going, especially when the court says on his last day of employment. And, and then it gets better. Just before his going away party, um, he decided to give himself a little gift which was 500,000 lines of code. Um, and he sent that off to Germany and then downloaded it uh, later uh, at, from Germany and of course he deleted everything that he did and of course he's surprised when uh, he has a who farted look when they come to arrest him, oh you're kidding. And uh, he ends up getting convicted of economic espionage for stealing the source code. Well, he appeals this um, and on the, at the appellate level, the appellate court held that this was not uh, a violation of the Economic Espionage Act. So before you think about going and doing that, it's been modified and amended to take that into consideration. So don't go do that. The next area of reasonableness and things you need to do prior to going and hacking somebody's computer, um, your I training, your information assurance policies and training. And the big aspect on this is, you know, having them in place, you know, you've got your banners, your user agreements, being consistent with them and enforcing them when something goes wrong. So especially with the insider threat aspect, if you're going to do a civil suit for computer fraud and abuse, you know, was, were employees being disciplined for violating these different procedures? So you want to make sure that you're enforcing these policies and you're actually uh, on top of them. Information control, hey, it's the stuff you all know about. It's the access lists, encryption, digital rights management. Again, another step for reasonableness. So if I've got to be in front of a judge, I can say, here are all the things I did before I had to actually go and retrieve my property. 
The deception piece is a very interesting aspect. When you get a bunch of lawyers sitting around just talking this stuff around, somebody in Verily will bring something up going, hey, did anybody ever think about the SEC? And you're like, what the hell does the SEC have to do with you know, a deception plan for this aspect? But companies have responsibilities to actually do reporting. And thanks to good old Reed Hastings and Netflix, you know, the SEC said we can come out and we can investigate anything we want that we think is a possible violation uh, of uh, the SEC laws. Now, I'm not uh, an SEC attorney and I don't want to be an SEC attorney. So you're going to go over to Dewey, Cheatham and Howe and go to the SEC branch to start getting their advice. Now, the disclosure piece on this becomes a very interesting aspect when you're in this area. So you want to do a deception plan. So you're going to have things out there internal to your network that's not going to be out there that are wrong and erroneous, that are deception. So it's no intent. You, you know, you're not going to make this public. And then they're stolen. And they're leaked to the media. All right? And is this a disclosure that you've made? I know. They're stolen. They're leaked to the media. You know, is this an SEC violation or not? I really don't know. Tell me how that works out when you run that past your SEC attorneys. You know, because when you're talking about deception plan or deception examples, what are you going to be putting out there? Request for proposals. Now, those could be your request for proposals that you're putting out to your suppliers, or they could be request for proposals that you've received as you're doing your bid preparations. So you're putting you know false information out there on there to be grabbed, you know, by your competitors so they don't know what you're doing. Blueprints and designs. All right, minor defects. We went back and, and we said, you know, self-defense of property, you can't, you know, harm somebody when you're going to defend your property. So a minor defect or a major defect, you know, are you going to cause harm? If it's a product, you know, that has engineering aspects of it, if it's computer code and somebody looks at it and downloads it and it melts their servers, are you liable? If it's a car and the brakes don't work, are you liable? I mean, so these are all things that you need to talk to uh, your folks about when you're planning on doing this. Business plans and financial records, again, you sit around, I'm not a mergers and acquisitions guy, but somebody comes up and goes, whoa, wait, mergers and acquisitions. You've got information about other people's real companies in here, and if that's stolen and leaked to the media, that could harm them. What if they come knocking on your door saying, this was your document, it's not true, I've suffered a harm, I want some money from you. Now, your lawyers are going to say, again, being risk adverse, I don't want to invite litigation in from this aspect. So you're going to have to be very specific as you go through this, talking to your attorneys, you know, how you're going to protect this from happening. Um, joke, because uh, I need a thinking break. Okay, so NSA is going to store a whole bunch of, yeah, it's controversial. Um, so all these little aspects of terabytes, petabytes, zettabytes, yottabytes. And I, so I don't know what a, you know, so I was wondering, what's a zettabyte? Well, I dated a zeta at Michigan, and so talk to me afterwards uh, about that. <laughs> Um, a, a petabyte. Um, do you realize if you Google the site of PETA, like this is the cleanest image you can actually put in a conference like this. So I guess that's a petabyte. And obviously the yottabyte's easy. You got that yottabyte. You have that yottabyte. And if that's not enough, they'll you can have a stream um, all over. So um, I don't have a sponsor. So active defense. Um, Actually, I did have a sponsor, but I don't want to get in trouble. Ask me afterwards. Um, active defense, recovery operations. Um, the Kobayashi Maru. You know, I, I, I do like the new Star Trek. I like, you know, the old one, but I like the new one too. And, you know, there is a certain aspect of a no-win situation um, and when you're, you're dealing with this. So um, I, I had colleagues ask, are you going to actually talk about Clark's Law that nobody has ever heard of? And I'm like, yeah, I am. Clark's Law, get your attorneys involved early and often explain the technology to them at a third grade level so they can understand it because they're going to have to turn to a judge, jury or senior leaders and explain it at a first grade level. So, you know, it is very important. Now, lawyers are, you're, and you're all smart, so you're going to hire good lawyers that have been very well trained to be analytical, to be able to ask the right questions on this aspect. And that's what lawyers should be trained to do. Be analytical and ask the right questions. And so when you're explaining the technology to them, you're walking them through that at that third grade level and they should be able to ask the questions and really understand it. There's another aspect I'm going to say of Clark's Law because my active defense scenario, I am not a PowerPoint ranger, uh, uh, so I have some very simplistic uh, graphics to kind of go through our active defense scenario. So we got our intruder. He's going through that innocent third party over to the victim. He's going to exfil some information over to an open FTP server. 
And he's got his other box, his, his other hop in point, his other, and he's going to download the information from there. So that's kind of our scenario for our, our, our active defense scenario aspect on life. So what can I do? So, you know, the aspects of logging. Yeah, we can log till the cows come home. So, you know, you can log that third party coming in. You're going to kind of look, see, has this third party touched me before? Is it, what have I got for my records? So log and stuff, that's a piece of cake from that aspect. You know, the FTP server, do you log C, the, the exfiltration of data going out? I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm going to knock off the exigent circumstances right now. Because I always get the, the argument, but they, they went to my R&D shop and, and got all the documents and took out a terabyte of stuff. I have got to go after it and get it. All right, look, you know, all right, fine. Then your lawyer needs to ask a question. You saw them do that. When they exfil the documents, what were the documents? And most of the time, we're finding out that they've encrypted them, so you have no clue what was taken. Now, you do have a diff, uh, you know, part of a, an argument to say, yeah, but I know it came from my R&D section as opposed to uh, just HR, which was probably just nothing like but social security numbers and personal information. Who cares about that? This is the company over here. Um, on that. But, you know, so from that aspect, you know, the exigent circumstances and having to go after it, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a challenge on that. But you see on your logs, they went to the FTP server out there, and you get that from your logs. Now, can you see the intruder on the FTP server, you know, can, you know, for the, it's open FTP server. Now this is the part where when Marsha Hoffman uh, from EFF was talking at um, Black Hat and she said the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is kind of vague when it, when it starts getting into that aspect of uh, without authority or in excess of your authority. Yes, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is vague, but I, I hate to go to the, the definition that I use for my children, you know what the right choice is. Are you in a place that you have a right to be? I mean, it, it kind of comes down to that. If you're in that gray area, you're going to want to make sure you're in a place you have a right to be. So that FTP server, when you get in there, if it's open and you can log on there, go ahead, hop on there. See where your files are from that aspect. Now, I'm not aware that logs of somebody else logging into the FTP server is usually something you can see. So usually you're going to have to elevate your privileges to see those logs from the FTP server to get to the intruder. Now, if that's the case, then you've probably exceeded your authorities in the access that you had, and that's probably count round one of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, be that as it may. We're going to cruise along here because I want to talk about deleting data. So can you delete the data on an FTP server? So if I'm on an open FTP, you can log in, I can log in, you can log in, anybody can get on. I think if we're all you know, in agreement that I'm in a place I have a right to be, would that be correct? Okay. There are files on there. They're available. I can open them up and look at them. You can open them up and look at them. I can download them. I can upload them. Again, is that kind of the way it's set up? Okay. Can I delete files that are uploaded by somebody else on there? Yes or no? Is the answer, if the answer is both, then say both. But if it's, to my world, it's typically no. Now, this is probably one of the stupidest, silliest things. My files have been stolen, uploaded there by somebody else. It's my property that was taken. I'm in a place I have a right to be. Can I delete those files? Logic says, yeah, well, hell yeah, they're my files, yes. But if I don't have that authority to delete files on that server, arguably, I don't have that authority. What am I going to do? Well, I'll go talk to your attorney and don't tell me. All right. So from that aspect, you know, it's an argument of whether I can delete that information or not. Can I go over to the intruder and delete that information that I've seen him take off of there? Closed, protected computer, I got no authority to be on that box. Uh, from that. So, you know, from that aspect, like I said, if you're going to do this, you go talk to your attorneys from that part and see how that works. What if that's an innocent third party over there? And what if you go to your attorneys and say, we went to the FTP server, it was, went out, uh, our documents went out, they're being stored by that party box. Can I, you know, get the logs from that? Can I go touch that box? Now, in this innocent third party, they don't even know it's there. How do you know it's not there? Because they've got, you know, terabytes of data there. There's, you know, a bunch of movies on there, there's a bunch of stuff on there, there's, there's no way they know what's on their system. Let's just go in there, take our stuff off and away we go. Well, again, the best way to do that is contact the third party and get consent. Anytime you get, con yeah, talk to any law enforcement, consent, yeah, hey, great, let's go. Um, anytime you can get consent, that's the way to go for it uh, when you're talking about that. Can you go back and trace them back? Now, now say you got an instant third party, they let you have their logs and you get back over to that intruder there. Again, we're still in that same situation where it's, we're stuck. You know, have you gone to law enforcement? Is law enforcement involved? Can they get there fast enough from that aspect? If it is a protected box, typically I cannot go there and get that information. Deleting the data, I want to move to, um, if it's a closed FTP server. If this is a closed FTP server 
and you get you see what the login information is from your logs. Can you go hop on it? Yes or no? I hear some no's. So when we listen to NSA and EFF up here, they talk about Smith versus Maryland. That's that case where when I give my phone record to the phone company, I've exposed it to a third party. I got no expectation of privacy in that. If I give you my login information, what's the difference? Yeah, here's the aspect. So you've got the logon information. It was exposed to you. I now know it. Why can't I use it? All right, so you borrow or you're, you're, you, know, you're, you loan to your neighbor your baseball mitt, some property, and you, give, and, and you want to get it back. And you go over to their house and they've got a cipher lock on their door. Now, they gave you that code because your kid had to take care of their cat um, on that. So you had the authority to go in and take care of the cat and use it. Do you have the authority to go over to your neighbor's house to get your baseball mitt back by using that cipher code at that particular time? No, typically you don't. I mean, that's, you're in your post-trespass recovery phase from this aspect of it. You know, that's the O.J. Simpson, don't breach the peace, don't do anything. I mean, so that's, you know, the aspects of it. So when you go talk to your lawyers about this aspect, you're going to say, here's the information I've got. Anybody can log into it using this information. Why can't I log into it using this information and go do it? And again, these are all these gray areas. <laughs> this is the great part on providing the advice because then you get to make the decision and if it's wrong, you're landed away in handcuffs and I'm having a steak dinner. And I won't have you as a client anymore, but at least I had my steak dinner. You know, so clearly when we're talking about these areas, they're very fact specific. And, and you know, so it's kind of difficult sometimes to get questions on if a fact changes, it changes what you can and cannot do. So you need to get involved with your attorneys as you're walking through this. And, and, and you know, obviously doing this requires good computer network exploitation in terms of your attribution and the logins that you've got there for this. You know, there's an aspect we always get to as far as stopping the pain when you're dealing with a uh, uh, denial of service attack. The part that I would say you really want to look at for this is DOJ has done the core flood botnet takedown and the documents are all publicly available. And, and, and the steps that they go through to be able to do this kind of gives you a, a blueprint for how to legally do this. And of course they are doing it with the courts involved from that aspect. So if you're curious about doing that part of it, um, the DOJ documents that are available, uh, publicly available out there are, are a good starting point to take a look at that. As I mentioned before, the, the IP commission report talks about a lot of a lot of different areas that you may want to do this and the American Bar Association is going to be coming out with their report uh, down the road. Here's the big thing and Jeff Moss uh, talks about this down the road. If you're going to do stuff like this, you need to get a good team of lawyers. He, Jeff is actually a, a fan. Where I've, I've been at talks where he's like, we need more lawyers who do this to advance this and, and not that anybody really likes lawyers. Um, be that as it may, you're really going to need um, a good team of lawyers to do this or if you're really going to do this, you just need one really good lawyer um, on that. Um, so with that said, I will be going to a Q&A session. If there's, I got three minutes for questions right now from what I understand. Um, so uh, if there's any questions, I will be hanging out up here. Thank you for coming. I hope you got a golden nugget out of this. Uh, if not, I hope there was a joke you laughed at. Thank you.